A baby's bond with his mother begins in the womb. A father's bond with his son comes later, but in many ways becomes stronger and can shape the outcome of the son's future. We look to our fathers for strength, for guidance, for understanding, and for compassion. When a son reaches adulthood, most want to have their accomplishments validated by their father. But what happens when a father who has been strong his whole life is struck down by debilitating heart disease? What does a son do as he watches his father deteriorate? What happens when the doctors say there are no options left? This is the story of one Aussie son's expression of love and determination not to let his father go quietly into the night. Mick Fleming is that Aussie son. After being told about a story on TV about adult stem cells, he reached out to the internet to get more information. What he found was a chance for a miracle. But his story doesn't stop there. His passion has been transformed into activism. He doesn't want to see another Aussie son suffer. Yeah, I will personally pay the airfare for any politician that's got the guts to go to Bangkok. <clears throat> you might have to cut that bit. I'll pay the airfare personally for any politician that's got the guts to go to Bangkok and see an Australian patient go through this process. It's saving people's lives. Coincidentally, we interviewed Shadow Minister for Health, John Paul Langbrook, on another issue. We showed him our first story on adult stem cell therapy and asked for his response. Well, it sounds promising, but I, you know, it's just not something that, um, that I would necessarily endorse. You had an old, old man that was shuffling along, leaning on the wall, barely able to walk, couldn't, couldn't hold his head up. I mean, he has to sit in these chairs because he's, he was incapable of sitting on a normal kitchen chair because he couldn't hold himself up. He was that far gone. He's always been a, a fit, sort of active bloke. He's a construction worker from years ago, so he's always outside. Um, you know, he used to be a professional boxer. I mean, he was a fit bloke. He had his heart attack in about 58. Uh, yeah, 58, I think he was. And he's just slowly sort of gone downhill. And for a number of years, they've managed it with uh, medicine and that. He was on oxygen here pretty well all the time. Um, couldn't, couldn't move um, 20 feet without basically collapsing. Um, his cardiac surgeon sent him away and said, come back and see me in a year, which you infer from that what you like. But I took it that, well, sorry, old son, there's nothing more we can do for it. So go away and die. I was fairly confident he'd be dead by Christmas. Um, I came in here one day to talk to him and he sort of said, ah, oh, look, so I'm just sitting here waiting to die. And as we know, once you give up mentally, it's, that's half the battle as well. So I sort of gave him a bit of a rev up and told him he could die when I bloody well told him he could and thought we'd better do something about it. So he was a dead man walking. My son came in one day and said, I've just seen a program on stem cell just a small snippet on National Geographic. I've gone on the net. Yeah, get on the computer and actually Googled it. And the first thing that came up was Vestcell. And I sort of spent the night looking through it and reading it. He said, no, I found this company in Bangkok called Theravitae. We'll admit to some scepticism because it was Bangkok and I thought, oh, I don't know. But I spoke to our GP on the Monday morning, who has personal knowledge of Bangkok. His daughter actually works there. And he said, look, they've got facilities there that are just absolutely light years ahead of anything we've got in Australia. Um, and he, he said, look, it's, it appears legit. Go for it. Uh, actually, the doctor, uh, Hoot, rang me back the next day. This was our Friday evening. The Saturday morning, he rang me, which was quite unusual because obviously a doctor here, there's no way you're going to phone call back. Um, they send us all the info that they required, the um, tests and everything. So yeah, we made the, um, the arrangements, organised the, uh, the flights. I think we were in Bangkok, would have been nine days later. There was an incident that happened on the plane on the way over that was pretty dramatic. He nearly died. We, um, we were told by the, the doctors that he couldn't fly, simple as that. Um, you know, he, he's... He was a very sick man. 
we told him we're going to Bangkok. Fortunately, the GP uh, was all for it. He helped as much as he could. He said he must be on oxygen on the plane or he will die. So we had oxygen and everything all, all set up. And we got on the plane and it's seven hours to um, Singapore, uh, roughly. About halfway, it was about two o'clock in the morning. The, he went down like a ton of bricks, just oxygen, nothing. Nothing was working. If he dies, he dies. It's a chance we, you know, we knew it was high risk going there. And it was very, very close. They had stretched him off the plane. And yeah, it was, he only just made it. There was no, um, yeah, no two ways about it. He was nearly dead. It's been about two months or so? About two months or so, yeah. And what yeah. have you seen as far as his condition now? Oh, unbelievable. Um, I'm not religious in any way, but this is the closest thing to a miracle I've ever seen. Two days after the operation, they did the op on eight o'clock Thursday night. He had been unable, it, the week he spent in the, in the hotel waiting to go for the op, he was unable to go downstairs for a meal or anything because he simply couldn't make it to the elevator. He just sat in the room, we had room service. He had the operation Thursday night. They kicked him out of the hospital Friday afternoon. We brought him home. I walked in Saturday morning and I thought, that's strange, he's up, he's made himself breakfast, um, you know, cornflakes, toast, whatever. And he just looked a lot brighter and I thought, no, I'm imagining things. You know, this is 36 hours after the operation. That afternoon he said, oh, I could murder a steak. I said, oh, I'll ring room service. He said, no, we'll go down to the um, restaurant, had a feed, come back, walked upstairs, good as gold. Absolutely unbelievable. He's, I believe he's gone back about three years in his deterioration. He's gone back to the way he was three or four years ago where he, he could still get around and do things. Um, quality of life has just gone through the roof. He's got a little shed outside, he potters around out there. Now he hasn't been out there in two and a half years because he just can't stand up in the shed to work. He spends five, six hours a day out there now, just potters around. Um, pretty good. How did you find the hospitals, the doctors and the nursing staff in Bangkok? Bangkok is amazing. The, the facilities they've got there is just mind-blowing. Um, they, they've got more stuff on one floor of their hospital than Brisbane's got in every hospital. The people are fabulous. Every nurse, every doctor, you know, the, the, the head of surgery talked to me for an hour after the op. In Australia, they walk past you, they, you, you know, unless you grab him by the ankle, he's not even going to acknowledge you, let alone talk to you. Now, recently, Queensland's Parliament has been uh, putting forth a bill about embryonic stem cell research. Yep. How do you feel about that when you don't hear anything talking about uh, adult stem cell research? I'm obviously not a doctor, I don't completely understand it, but it works. I mean, there's, there's, I've seen it with my own eyes, it works. If this stuff works, why not get in here and get going with it? You know, we've proven it works. And the politicians need to be, you know, if necessary, drag screaming and kicking over there to see, you know, let them go over with somebody that's, that's having the op. It's a no-risk situation. We pay, their tax, we pay the tax anyway. Pay for the, the health minister to go over there with what with the patient and watch what happens and watch the improvement and then let him come back and say, no, it doesn't work. If this is saving lives, that's what they should be doing. They should be saving people, not messing around, arguing. This process does not use anything um, other than your own blood. There's no ethical problem. There's no, you're not killing babies or whatever, all the crap they beat up in the media. Maybe there is a long-term problem they don't know about yet for the testing. But hey, when you've got three or six months to live, do you really care if you're going to die in five years' time from some complication of it? You know, if Dad grew three heads in three or four years' time, we wouldn't care. He would have been dead by now anyway. You know? I will personally pay the airfare for any politician that's got the guts to go to Bangkok. It's saving people's lives. You know, why are we stuffing around with crap in Parliament while people are dying. And if this process works, if it only works for 20% of people, although their success rate seems to be phenomenally higher than that, that, yeah, their kids and their grandkids have still got next Christmas rather than going to a funeral. Would you say that this treatment has given you your life back? Oh, yes. 
Yeah. And what would you... In the morning. Hey ho, hey ho. It's up to work they go. A shovel and a pick. And a stem cell stick. Hey ho, hey ho. So if someone else was in this similar predicament and had congestive heart failure, cardiomyopathy, what would you tell them? Well, I would say go to Bangkok and, and get it done. <laughs>